Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. This morning, we will continue our reading and discussion of Martin Luther's great Protestant work entitled On the Councils and the Church. Last time we concluded that uh, Martin Luther was calling for a free Christian council specifically and solely for the purpose of dealing with the the papal heresy, to destroy the papacy, set it aside, to destroy it, and everything about it. Martin Luther is plainly identifying the papacy as the Antichrist, the false Christ, the counterfeit Christ, who has usurped Christ's rightful throne and has cast aside the true faith of Jesus Christ and replaced it with nothing but wickedness. And it was time for it to be dissolved. That's the council that Martin Luther would have convened. But the council that was convened after, shortly after Martin Luther's death was the Trent. It waged, it declared an all-out war of annihilation against Protestantism, against the Protestant heresy, as they called it, and that 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 war continues today. And we will retreat a paragraph for continuity purposes to kind of regather our thoughts. Martin Luther says, I will speak German. The Pope should not only abolish his tyranny of human ordinances in council, proposed council, but also hold with us that even the good works performed in accordance with God's commandments cannot help to achieve righteousness, uh, righteousness, to blot out sin, or to attain God's grace. Only faith can do this. Faith in Christ, who is a king of righteousness in us through his precious blood, death, and resurrection, with which he blotted out our sins for us, made satisfaction, reconciled God, and redeemed us from death, wrath, and hell. Therefore, he should condemn, the Pope should condemn and burn all of his bulls, his decretals, books on indulgences, purgatory, monasteries, saint worship, and pilgrimages, together with all his countless lies, adulteries, lies and adulteries, since they rant directly against the article of St. Peter. And what is the article of St. Peter? That you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And that's the true faith of of as he calls it, St. Peter's. It's a true faith of, of Christ. Now, I would like to add also, this is where I believe Martin Luther failed and the Protestant Reformers failed. Right along with all the holy days and all of the, all of the additions, diabolical additions of the articles of faith that the papacy has in- instituted, the papacy and Martin Luther together should have abolished the observance of Sunday as the Sabbath, or the Lord's Day as they call it. They should have abolished the pagan religion or religious holiday called, later called Christmas, which was before called Saturnalia and Mithra and all other. It was observed throughout history, and it speaks of Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz, not God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or the birth of Mary, uh, uh, the birth of Jesus. Christmas is just a baptized pagan holiday, and its influence in the world is obvious now. Okay, It, it should have been abolished right along with the pagan Easter festival. Nothing but a pagan uh, fertility festival 
and it has nothing to do with Christ. It never should have been introduced into the Christian world, and it is the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy that instituted these things. Matter of fact, the observance of Sunday was even instituted by the ancient pagan Roman Caesars, okay, in 321 A.D. And these three things, Christmas, Easter, and Sunday worship, are literally the common thing that has formed the foundation for the unification of the Protestant churches back into the Roman Catholic Church, this, this, direction, this directive called ecumenism. And I've maintained all along that while Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformers were on the right track, calling the papacy the Antichrist, and doing away with all of the extra-biblical ordinances and bulls and festivals and traditions of men that have come out of the papacy, they should have included Sunday, Christmas, and Easter. All right, enough said about that. I've talked about that frequently here on First Amendment Radio. I know it offends a lot of people, but that's, uh, that's the way it is. You know, Martin Luther has given us the example of the illogical uh, historical events. And one example he gave us was when the righteous kings of Israel restored the true faith of God, the true worship of God, they made a grievous error in allowing to stand within their nation the ancient groves of the pagans, the ancient high places of worship for the for the sun god Baal to be truly logical in reestablishing the ancient faith uh, of the Israel Israelite people, the worship of the true God, they should have abolished and destroyed those ancient pagan sun worship temples, the temples to Baal, but they didn't. I make the same charge against the Protestant reformers. They called the papacy the Antichrist. All of his bulls and rescripts, his encyclicals, all of the writings of the popes, Roman Catholic canon law, all the nunneries and monkeries and holy water and 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 uh, all the trappings of Roman Catholicism should have been done away with. And yet they left Christmas, Easter, and Sunday standing. Martin Luther made the same mistake. And I think it's time for us to correct it. It's high time for God's people to purge out all of the Roman leaven from the Christian lump. Okay? Feast of Unleavened Bread would still have meaning for us today if we observed it and understood the meaning of that that holy feast of the Lord. That would be a welcome replacement for the pagan holidays called Christian. That is Christmas, Easter, and Sunday Sabbath. Now, Luther continues. He says, uh, if I can find my place here, Therefore he should condemn and burn all of his bulls, creedles, books on indulgence, purgatory, monasteries, saint worship, and pilgrimages, together with all his countless lies and idolatries, since they rant directly against the article of St. Peter. The Pope should also return everything that he bought, stole, robbed, plundered, and acquired through it, especially his false primacy which he extols as being so necessary that no one can be saved who is not subject to him. The Pope's hat did not die for my sins, nor is its name Christ. And all Christians before and under him were sanctified and saved without his hat. Okay, this reference to the papal hat is a reference to the papacy itself. No one was saved because they were subject to the Roman pontiff. As a matter of fact, you want to assure that you have forsaken the grace that God has has bestowed upon us simply become a subject 
of the Roman pontiff instead of a subject of Christ. All right? You cannot serve two masters. You cannot claim Christ as your Savior. Put yourself under the uh, subjectivity of the papacy. You're either Christ's or you're not. Simple as that. Now, this is where we left off last Friday. It says, this, I think, is indeed an important enough matter about which to hold an impressive, decisive, and mighty counsel. Okay? Martin Luther has just let the cat out of the bag. This is the sole reason for convening a true, free Christian council to do away permanently with the papacy. It says, and the emperor and the king should lead a hand here and force the pope into the council if he is unwilling, as the emperors did in the four principal councils. In the four principal councils, it was mandatory that those who were subjects of, uh, uh, subject to the critical uh, assessment of the council were forced to attend. Right? Very purpose for the uh, attendance of those councils were to deal with the Arian heresy and the Nestorian heresy. We've talked about them before. This one that Martin Luther proposes is to deal with the papal heresy. Okay? The heretic of heretics. And he says, but not all bishops, abbots, monks, doctors, and worthless riffraff, or the large number of hangers-on, could come to the council. Otherwise, it will be a council that spends its first year in arriving and in quarreling over who should sit at the head and who is to walk ahead of whom, the second year in reveling, banqueting, racing, and fencing, in other words, entertainment, the third year in other matters and also in bur burning perhaps a John Huss or two, and meanwhile incurring expenses so vast that one could indeed finance a campaign against the Turks. Okay? So Martin Luther is going to exclude the Roman riffraff. Okay? It's going to be a biblical council. Those who are qualified, well read in the scriptures, to deal with this antichrist heresy known as the papacy. There's not going to be any partying. There's not going to be any quarreling about who goes in first and who walks behind whom. No rank, no pomp, no circumstance. Strictly business. Strictly God's business. Okay? It is on the contrary, it would be necessary to summon from all lands people who are thoroughly versed in the Holy Scripture and who are also seriously and sincerely concerned with God's honor, the Christian faith, the church, the salvation of souls, and the peace of the world. Among them, there should also be a few intelligent and reliable laymen. Okay? Not just the, the, uh, the hierarchy, but also the laymen are important in the council, says Martin Luther. Again, he says, among them, there should also be a few intelligent and reliable laymen, for this is also a matter that concerns them, and he says, for instance, a Sir Hans Schwarzenberg, where if he were living, he and men like him could be trusted. And it would suffice if there were a total of 300 select men to whom the fate of the country and the people could be entrusted. Just as the first council, that is the Council of Nicaea, had only 318 members coming from all the lands the Turks and our monarchs now rule, and 17 of them were false and Aryan anyway. Okay? So Martin Luther's going to be very careful not to invite 
heretics to the council. The layman will be thoroughly versed in the scripture. Who else would one expect to attend a free Christian council but those who are well read in the scriptures? He said the second in, at Constantinople had 150, the third at Ephesus 200, the fourth at Chalcedon 630, almost as many almost as many as the others combined, and yet these men were quite unlike the fathers of Nicaea and Constantinople. In other words, he's refreshing our memories that uh, the successive councils got worse and worse and worse. Martin Luther does not want to make the same mistakes as the previous councils. It's going to be a small, compact, super-powerful, scriptural assembly to deal with the papal heresy, to deal with the Antichrist of the scriptures of history and of prophecy, to put away the man of sin, the son of perdition, the mask for Satan himself, the papacy, and to put away all of his false teachings, all of his idolatries, all of his blasphemies, all of his papal bulls, his Roman Catholic canon law, his traditions that have replaced God's law, and to do away with it and restore Christianity to the service of Christ, not the service of the Pope. It says, moreover, the affairs of all countries that no one else can or cares to judge, as well as old superannuated and bad quarrels, should not be unearthed and dumped into the lap of the council. Okay? Don't bring all your garbage with you. you. Your petty fighting at home stays at home. The council is going to be called to deal with the papacy, and that is all. We're not going to allow the council to rule in every little petty squabble. We're not going to burden the council with any extraneous issues. We're going to deal with the papal heresy, and we're going to adjourn. It's going to be quick. It's going to be tidy, it's going to be powerful, it's going to be conclusive, and we're not going to clutter it up with a lot of feuding and fighting over prestige or who said what to whom. Okay? This is the purpose of a council. Deal with a heresy. All right? It says a Constantine should be there to rake up all these matters and cast them into the fire ordering that they, to be, that they should be judged and decided at home in the respective countries. He should order them to attack instead the question at issue and dispose of these as quickly as possible. Then the Pope's heresies, indeed his abominations, would be read in public one by one and all would be found in opposition to St. Peter's article that is, you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, and to the ancient faith of the church, which has adhered to St. Peter's doctrine from the beginning of the world, and they would be promptly condemned, etc. The papacy. Lock, stock, and barrel the office of the papacy and everything that has come out of it would be swiftly condemned after its heresies were read in public. It would be condemned on the basis of Scripture and set aside, ended, and the council would adjourn. That's what Martin Luther was calling for. He was right to call for it, just as we would be right to call for it. Quote, well, unquote, you say, quote, it is futile to hope for such a council, unquote. Martin Luther says, I myself so, uh, think so too. But if one wants to talk about it and asks and wishes for a council, one would have to wish for a council like that 
or forget about it completely. Desire none and say nothing at all. Okay? Martin Luther says, Give me a counsel to deal with the papal heresy and it alone, or we're not going to have any counsels at all. No more counsels. We either deal with the, the papal heresy in a true, free, Christian council, or we don't have a council at all, ever. Now, you see the priority that Martin Luther has given this council? He said, if, but if one wants to talk about it or ask and wishes for a council, one would have to wish for a council like that or forget about it completely, desire none, and say nothing at all. For the first council in Nicaea and the second one in Constantinople were councils like that, whose examples could indeed be easily followed. And I point this out to show that it would be the duty of emperors and kings, since they are Christians, to summon such a council for the salvation of the many thousands of souls that the Pope, with his tyranny and avoidance of a council, as far as he is concerned, allows to perish, even though they all could be restored to St. Peter's article and to be the true ancient Christian faith. Otherwise, they would have to be lost, for they cannot obtain this doctrine of St. Peter because they neither hear nor see anything of it. The papacy does not represent the true faith of Jesus Christ. It represents its own faith. It does not uphold God's law. It upholds its own law. It's tyranny. It's anti-Christ tyranny. That's what it is. And a true Christian council would restore the ancient Christian faith. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. That's what a council could do. And if it can't do that, then there's no purpose for holding a council. And we can see through history that every council that has been called, beginning at the Council of Trent, were nothing but papal councils called by the papacy for the papacy and of the papacy to uphold his blasphemous pretensions to impose upon the world his tyrannical laws his good works his means of salvation and the servitude of the whole world to the papacy that's been the purpose of every single council since the council of Trent including the Council of Trent. Don't mis misunderstand. There's never been, since Martin Luther, there has never been a true, free, Christian council. They have all been papal councils. The man of sin, the son of perdition, rules through the councils. For 500 years, the world's been tyrannized except for those who regard the papacy as the Antichrist, have no regard for his laws, no regard for his words, no regard for his letters, and call him what he is, the papal Antichrist, and serve Christ and him alone. They are the only ones, if there is any freedom in this world today, they are the only ones who enjoy it. But it's in spirit only. Because the civil laws of every land force all of us to conform to Roman Catholic canon law and be made subjects with or without our knowledge, with or without our consent, become subjects of the Roman pontiff. We've come upon the break. We'll be back right after these messages. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month, and you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25, or any single program on tape, MP3 CD, or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program. Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Don't do Internet? Then call 559-781-3773 and we'll be honored to help you. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio. Also, as some of my listeners have done, they email me with questions, comments. Uh, my email address is tom at seawaves.us. That's tom at s-e-a-w-a-v-e-s dot u-s. And also check out the website, inquisitionupdate.org. Now, Martin Luther is calling for a free Christian council to deal with the papal heresy, to destroy the papacy. And he's also calling upon the monarchs, the Christian monarchs of Europe, the civil power, as outlined for us in Romans chapter 13, they are to be the servants of God, okay, not the Pope, They are to be the servants of God, and their purpose is to reward good and to punish evil. Martin Luther is saddling the monarchs of Europe with the responsibility, the God-given responsibility, to force the papacy to attend this council. That's their purpose. They are to serve God then it's their purpose to bring the papal heretic, the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy, to a free Christian council to be summarily condemned. The papacy will not come willingly. The Christian monarchs of Europe, in their service to Christ, must chain him and bring him to the council. He says, and if... And even if other monarchs decline to do anything toward a principal council, in other words, if the monarchs of Europe should decide the papacy should be unmolested and they fail to serve Christ and, and bring this papal monster to the council to be condemned, then he says German emperors Charles and German princes could still hold a provincial council in Germany. What's Martin Luther declaring here? That if Europe will not bring the papacy to justice, Germany should do it. Germany alone should do it. Now do you understand why Germany was the very hotbed of the First and Second World Wars? The papacy has punished Germany and still punishes Germany today for its insistence upon bringing the papal heretic to trial. 
Now you know why Hitler was a son of the Roman Catholic Church. And he brought that evil, wicked Second World War upon Germany. A Germany that was capable of rendering the papal justice all by itself. Martin Luther think, says, some think that this would result in a schism. But who knows? If we did our part, if we did our part in it and sincerely sought God's honor and the salvation of souls, God might yet touch and turn the hearts of the other monarchs so that they would, in time, approve and accept the judgment of this council. Martin Luther is plainly saying, we put the papacy on trial right here in Germany, all by ourselves, without the help of the European monarchs. And we'll condemn the papacy and put him out of business permanently. We will condemn, we will read and condemn all of his heresies publicly, so that eventually... When the dust clears and the monarchs of Europe begin to comprehend what we've done and why, they'll side with us if they are true Christian monarchs, if they truly serve God and Him alone as is required in Romans chapter 13. Okay? That's what Martin Luther's hoping for. If Europe cannot unite to bring the papal heretic to trial, then we'll do it alone right here in Germany with the hope that the Holy Spirit will take our counsel and convict the hearts of the Christian monarchs of Europe and convince them that it was the right thing to do, that it was God's business to do. Martin Luther hopes that if not now, sooner or later, Germany might turn the hearts of God's people to him and against the papal antichrist. Even at the risk of throwing Germany into schism, Germany should take the responsibility and try the papal heretic. Does some think that this would result in a schism, but who knows? If we did our part in it and sincerely sought God's honor and salvation of souls, God might yet touch and turn the hearts of the other monarchs so that they would in time approve and accept the judgment of this council. It could not happen suddenly, but if Germany were to accept it, it would also have an echo in other countries. Whither, whither it cannot or can hardly reach out without a great preacher such as the council is, and without a strong voice heard from afar. Martin Luther's holding out hope that the acts of a, of, of a local German Christian council that would condemn the papacy would eventually be honored by the rest of Europe. He says, well then, if we must despair of a council and let us commend the matter to the true judge or merciful God. In other words, if we can't convene a council ourselves, then we must, we must commend this matter, this papal matter, to the true judge, our merciful God. And that's who's going to finally destroy the papacy. Martin Luther's council is going to be held it is yet future, and we already know the outcome of that, of that council. That the papacy will be destroyed without hand. Okay? Martin Luther is going to get his council. The Council of Trent, the First Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council, they are not the last council. The last council will be convened by God himself and the papal heresy will finally be decided by the true judge. And he says, Meanwhile, we shall promote the small and the young councils, that is, parishes and schools, and propagate St. Peter's article in every way possible. In every way possible, Martin Luther suggests that they restore the true Christian faith so that it may be seen side by side with the false Christian faith of Roman Catholicism, so that the world can make its own decision. 
That's how it's been ever since. That the purpose of the the the, the highly dreamt at true Christian council, if the European monarchs won't convene it, if the German monarchy won't convene it, and we have to forego a council, we will hold the council right in the parish schools, right in the churches, right in the homes. Okay? Martin Luther's not going to give up on, ha on putting the papacy to trial. If Europe doesn't do it, if Germany doesn't do it, then we'll do it right here in the homes by the parents, in the schools by the school teachers, and by the pastors in the churches. We will condemn the papal heresy. We will call him what he is, the Antichrist. And do you know what's really sad? The call for the destruction of the papal heresy is gone from the parents and from the schools and from the pastors. Now it's just left the one voice here, one voice there, two voices over here, one voice over there, and none of us are heard. Buried on the Internet where no one can find us. But we still call for a free Christian council to condemn the papal heresy. And we know we're going to get our wish. If men won't do it, Christ will. God hasten the day. It says, meanwhile, we shall promote the small and the young councils, that is, in parish churches and schools, and propagate St. Peter's article in every way possible, preserving it against all the accursed new articles of faith and of the new good works which the Pope has flooded the world. I shall comfort myself when I see the children wearing bishops' masks, thinking that God makes and will make genuine bishops of these play bishops. On the other hand, I shall regard as play bishops and mockers of God's majesty those who, according to their title, ought to be real bishops. As Moses says, quote, They have stirred me to jealousy with that which is no God. So I will stir them to jealousy for those who are no people. I will provoke them with a foolish nation. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 21. It will not be the first time that God repudiates bishops. In Hosea, he threatened, quote, Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. Unquote. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. And so it came, and so it comes to pass. May that suffice regarding the councils. In conclusion, we shall now also speak about the church. So Martin Luther has concluded his discussion about councils. There's one thing we can all glean from this. The councils were councils of men. The councils were called to deal with heresies. The councils upheld the deity of Christ and the deity of the Holy Spirit. That was God's purpose for the councils. Ever since then, the papacy has had control of the councils. And ever since then, the papacy has upheld his deity. See how necessary it is for that final free Christian council? Christ is going to bring it to us. Martin Luther has concluded his discussion about the councils. Now he wants to speak about the church. After all, the title of the work is called On the Councils and the Church. Having put aside his discussions on the councils, he now focuses on the church. He says, Just as they scream about the fathers and the councils, without knowing what fathers and councils are, only to drown out our voices with mere letters, so they also scream about the church. But as for saying what, who, and where the church is, they do not, re they do not render either the church or God even the service of asking the question or thinking about it. 
In other words, they're just as clueless about what the church is as they were about what a council is. That is the papal monarchy, the papal heresy. He says they, li they like very much to be regarded as the church, as pope, cardinals, bishops, and yet to be allowed under the, this glorious name to be nothing but pupils of the devil, desiring nothing more than to practice sheer knavery and villainy. Did you know that the papacy claims to be the church? That all the church is wrapped up in the pope. If it weren't for the pope, the church would no longer exist. Just as if Christ no longer existed, neither would the true church. See what a counterfeit parallel it is? The papacy regards himself with the same sanctity as Christ. So the papacy calls himself the church. But Martin Luther is going to tell us who the church is. He says, well then, setting aside various writings and analyses of the word, quote-unquote, church, we shall this time confine ourselves simply to the children's creed, which says, quote, I believe in one holy Christian church, the communion of saints, unquote. Here the creed clearly indicates what the church is, namely, a communion of saints, that is, a crowd or assembly of people who are Christians and holy, which is called a Christian holy assembly or church. Yet this word church is not German and does not convey the sense or meaning that should be taken from this article. Now let me tell you something that I've mentioned before on Inquisition Update. In the true Christian church, the saints are saints because they live a saintly life. They're living, breathing people. Saints are live Christian people. I'm a saint, according to the definition of the term. I'm alive. I live and breathe and serve Christ. Therefore, I am a saint. In the Roman Catholic Church... All the saints are dead. In the Roman Catholic Church, you cannot be called a saint unless you have died, and then your history, your life has been minutely examined by the Roman Catholic hierarchy, and you have been canonized officially by the Roman Catholic Church. You've been elevated to the, to the position of sainthood, having achieve your own salvation by your good works and then accrued so much excess good works and grace that you can become, well, like a bank account where Roman Catholics can pray to you and receive benefices of, of grace from your excesses. Okay? It's called super irrigation, where your excess good works and your excess grace that you have earned in excess of what is necessary for your own salvation can be gifted to someone else that is either dead or alive. Excess good works, excess grace that can be purchased for a price. Okay? It's become the biggest money-making cash cow for the Roman Catholic Church in history. Called simony in the Bible. The buying and selling of ecclesiastical favor. The buying and selling of grace. That's how the church, the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan, more correct, has become the most wealthy institution in the history of the world. On that very market alone, the Roman Catholic Church excels all other churches in the world for wealth, which is to say little of its wealth. It's incalculable. As we read in, Mar in uh, Avril Manhattan's book, The Vatican Billions, which is mistitled, it should have been called The Vatican Trillions, uh, makes it perfectly clear that the, to calculate the wealth 
material wealth of the Roman Catholic Church would be virtually impossible. Much of the wealth, the physical wealth of the Roman Catholic Church is held in third-party hands to protect it from the state, taxation, and one thing and another. But that which is clearly owned by the Roman Catholic Church is beyond anyone's capability to assess. All right. So now we know the difference between the saints, biblical saints, and sainthood in the Roman Catholic Church. All right. Just as they scream about the fathers and the councils without knowing what fathers and councils are, only to drown out our voices with mere letters, so they also scream about the church. But as for saying what, who, or where the church is, they do not render either the church, uh, either the church of God, even the service of asking the question or thinking about it. They like very much to be regarded as the church as pope cardinals bishops and yet be allowed and yet, and yet to be allowed under this glorious name to be nothing more than pope, pope, popish devils papal devils pupils of the devil servants of satan that's what they are martin luther's clearly declaiming the papacy his cardinals his bishops his priests the whole lot to be nothing but pupils of the devil did he not previously tell us plainly that the papacy is simply a mask for Satan itself? And therefore, likewise, we can expect Martin Luther to be consistent. The Pope is the devil. His cardinals and his bishops and all under his authority are nothing but pupils of the devil, desiring nothing more than to practice sheer knavery and villainy. That's their purpose in the world to blaspheme God, and to make Christianity a villainous thing. That's why Christianity is so hated in this world. It's not Christ that the world It's the Antichrist that the world hates. It's not Christianity that the world hates. It's the Christianity as, 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 as viewed by the world, as, as promoted by the Roman Catholic Church. What would the world think of Christianity? Those in the true faith of Jesus Christ, if the papacy were destroyed and people could once and for all see with their own eyes what true Christianity is. What a blessing to the world. The same blessing that Israel was to be to the world. But it was dominated by Pharisees and Sadducees. And likewise, the true body of Christ, true Christianity, is dominated by the man of sin, the son of perdition. Hardly to be called anything but what it is, the synagogue of Satan. Now he says, well then, setting aside various writings and analyses of the word church, we shall this time confine ourselves simply to the children's creed, which says, I believe in one holy Christian church, the communion of saints. Living saints. Here the creed clearly indicates what the church is, namely a communion of saints, living saints. That is, a crowd or assembly of people who are Christians and holy, which is called a Christian holy assembly or church. Yet this word church is not German and does not convey the sense or meaning that should be taken from this article. In Acts chapter 19, verse 39, the town clerk uses the word ecclesia for the congregation or the people who had gathered at the marketplace, saying, quote, it shall be settled in the regular assembly, unquote. Further, quote, when he said this, he dismissed the assembly, unquote, verse 41. In these and other passages, the word ecclesia or church is nothing but an assembly of people, though they probably were heathens and not Christians in this case. It is the same term used by town councilmen for their assembly, which they summoned to the city hall. Now, there are many peoples in the world. The Christians, however, are a people with a special call and are therefore called not just ecclesia or church or people, 
but Sancta Catholica Christiana, that is, a Christian holy people who believe in Christ. That is why they are called a Christian people and have the Holy Spirit who sanctifies them daily, not only through the forgiveness of sins acquired for them by Christ, as the antinomians foolishly believe, but also through the abolition and purging and the mortification of sins on the basis of which they are called a holy people. Okay? Thus, the, quote, holy Christian church, unquote, is synonymous with a Christian or holy people, or as one is also wont to express it, the ho with holy Christendom, or whole Christendom. The Old Testament uses the term God's people. Okay? So the church could be defined as God's people. The people are the church, and only those people who are gods, who belong to God, who make themselves subjects of God, and worship and obey God. That is the church. Now, anyone else who calls itself the church is a liar and a thief, and a robber, trying to climb over the walls to get into the kingdom. They're counterfeits, are they not? And the, and the papacy is that great counterfeit. This is the point of Martin Luther's discussion. He's a, he has concluded his discussion about the councils. Now he's going to speak about the church and I'm anxious to hear what Martin Luther has to say, and I know you are too. But we've come to the end of the program. Thanks for listening this morning. Check out the website, inquisitionupdate.org, and send me an email if you want, tom at seawaves.us. Blessings in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago, the Messiah whom Daniel prophesied. The 70th week of Daniel is over. I'll see you then. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.